Okay, so it's good to be with you again. Uh, we're looking at Lord's Day 9, uh, question 26. Uh, that's the Lord's Day we're going to do in this segment and the next segment right after this. I, I always record two segments at one time. Um, so we're just going to look at the first half of the question and answer. Uh, and then in the next, next segment, we'll look at the second half. And then next time, uh, when I come back for recording, we'll actually look at the word providence, which is a very interesting uh, word. I just mentioned that because the word providence is, is referenced in this answer, but I'm not going to talk too, too much about it uh, because that has a separate question and answer uh, to, to 27. Um, but basically what these questions do, 26, 27, and 28, is they teach us that we do not worship and serve and we're not related to an impersonal force. Uh, Tim Keller was saying in the first century after Jesus Christ, um, many historians uh, argue that they were very surprised the church survived because the leader was no longer there. Of course, they didn't know about the spirit being in their hearts, but typically when a leader dies and doesn't really leave behind a written legacy, uh, the, the following dies. Uh, Jesus didn't write anything except perhaps some sins in the sand that was uh, uh, blown away uh, with the wind. But what, what gave the, the Christian religion a lot of impetus, a lot of force, a lot of um, vitality is that um, there, was a, there was a plague in the first century. And the Christians, of course, showed their love by caring for those that, were in the, that had the plague. But also they related to a very personal God uh, that would weep with them, right? Jesus wept with the Jews. Jesus wept with Martha and Mary. Uh, we read in Genesis 6 that it broke God's heart, that he had to destroy uh, mankind that he had placed upon the face of the earth. So God is a God deeply emotionally connected to humankind. And in the Greek mythology, there was no God like that. You were always trying to reach the gods, and they didn't really care what really happened to you as long as they got their homage, their pound of flesh. Of course, those gods were just imagination of man's, man's uh, mind. Um, but the true God, the living God, was not an impersonal force. Now, we're going back to the days of, of spiritualism, and sometimes people use the a term, I'll let the force be with you, or something like Mother Nature. I know one guy, he was looking for uh, something to worship, and he began to worship nature. And, and one uh, winter day, he got stuck in a snowstorm, and he had to walk a mile home, and he nearly froze to death. Well, that was the end of him worshiping nature. He found it very impersonal, very cold, and very devastating, and, and very cruel, and, 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 and deadly, and deathly. Um, but we don't worship an impersonal force. We worship someone that has a heart, and a soul, and a mind that is emotionally connected to the human family. So that's why we have this beautiful answer uh, of the Catechism from the Confession, which begins with, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And we're going to look at it, but just as a way of introduction, uh, when I think of the word father, of course, that's a very endearing word, right? That's, that's very endearing. People that have not known their father really have missed out a, a, a lot in life. Now, I talked about that last time, uh, not having a, a partner or not having a family, uh, and the church does provide. Uh, but there is something special about having a good relationship with the father. Now, once again, once you mention the word father to many people, they get very agitated because they haven't had good experiences with fathers. Not all fathers are good, and, and some have really misused uh, their, their position of father. Uh, but we serve a loving father. We serve a kind father. We serve a father that is deeply relatable to us. So God is so big, and that's what we're going to hear in this, this question and answer. God is so big and so vast that we can't even get our hands and minds around it, and yet He's so tender as a father would, would cradle his, his newborn uh, child. And, and it's sometimes been compared somewhat weakly, but maybe from a human perspective, it may be the closest we can get. Uh, you think of this big, giant football player that's, that's even taller than me and 100 pounds more than I am, right? Uh, six foot six. 300 pounds, right? A great linebacker that smashes into everyone. And yet he has a, has a newborn and he cradles his newborn. This, this power of strength and muscle and might and, 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 and a fighting spirit cradles this newborn uh, like a tender father. 
And that's the Father we have. He is big. He is mighty. He is so big and He's so almighty and He's so eternal we can't, we can't fathom Him. And yet He reduces, we could say, well, he, he relates to us, I should say, He relates to us with the word Father, right? Actually, Abba, right? Which means Daddy. That's how close He wants to be uh, to us. So, the, the confession of all ages, remember this confession of faith comes from the Catholic Church, which was a church basically that came out of the days of the apostles following uh, Christ. It was the, the, the beginning of, of, the, of the Christian church. And they came up with what they called this Apostles' Creed, um, not because there was uh, 12 apostles and therefore 12, uh, 12 uh, articles to this creed, but it was the basic tenets of what the apostles learned by following Jesus. And this was really kind of put together even before perhaps uh, the canon of, of the New Testament was actually put together. But it began with this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful article, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So there you see the tenderness of God, his Father, um, but also the almighty power of God, the creator or the maker out of nothing of heaven and earth. And then you get this beautiful word, which is purely relational, uh, which is I believe. When we deeply believe in somebody, they have our heart, they have our mind, they have our soul. We think about them, we talk about them, sometimes we dream about them. If, if we're not close to them, perhaps we write about them or we write letters to them. We deeply believe in that relationship. And that's a deep relationship between human man, uh, humankind and, and divine, God the Father Almighty in heaven. So, the question is, what do you believe when you say that? What do you mean when you say, I believe, I believe in God the Father Almighty? And some of us can still remember being in Reformed churches uh, of a past era uh, when, you know, maybe a thousand people in the church would all say together on a Sunday night, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And uh, unfortunately, it became ritual, it became rote. But it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful confession, and we have a beautiful answer here that we're really not going to have time to really uh, disseminate as I would like to, but we will look at it very, very briefly. I often feel that I really don't do a great service to the Catechism for all what is in here, but once again I remind you that these sessions would be good uh, to come together with two or three people and discuss them and, and use it as a basis of, of a Bible study. So anyhow. The answer, the first half of the answer that we're going to look at in this segment, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ his Son. That, that's, just, that's just beautiful. I just said uh, more recently, um, because as you study the Word of God and as you read books and as you talk to people, uh, you, you hear different uh, voices and different points of view. And sometimes, of course, the Bible can seem very archaic. It can seem very cruel. It can seem very bloodthirsty. It can seem very, <clears throat> you know, explicit sexuality. And, and people take these sections out and they say, I can't read a book like that. But what the Bible does, it reaches into the very brokenness of our culture, the brokenness of our sexuality, the brokenness of our violence, the brokenness of our relationship to each other, the brokenness of our relationship to God. I said it in the last, uh, last session, right? The first three chapters is God putting it all together, or the first two. The third one is us breaking it, and the rest of the Bible is about redemption, God bringing it back together. And sometimes when we read about the sins of the patriarchs, like Abraham having more than one wife at one time and, and, and going the way of the flesh, it does, it's not there for a positive example, it's there for a negative example. That we can say we're the most godly person in the, in the world, but if we don't follow what God has prescribed in His Word, even though sometimes God allows it, but we're going to see the brokenness of those decisions. And that's why the Bible is the most transparent book of all humanity. But the bottom line is, in the Bible, you will never read such clear, crisp testimony of the divine redemption. And we're going to read some of that in Isaiah 40. I've actually written uh, the text there. We, 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 I, I really would like to read those verses because they're just very powerful, but we don't have a lot of time uh, to spend on that. But the question is, uh, why are we reminded that God is eternal, right? 
And if we begin with verse 10, right, it talks about the sovereign Lord, his sovereignty, that he can do what he wants. Um, then verse 11, he tends his flock like a shepherd. See, that's the bigness of God and the tenderness of God. We have a picture of the Good Shepherd in our chapel. Uh, it came from uh, Valley Hospital. It's a stained glass picture in the window. And I love to go there on a Sunday afternoon before service. And the sun is shining through that picture. And it just seems so real. But what's the Good Shepherd doing? He's tending to a little lamb in his hands. That's the Good Shepherd. He's so great. He's so sovereign. He's so... He's so divine, he's so creative, and yet he's so tender that he tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. You can't find a more tender father than Jesus Christ, and th uh, than, than God the Father. And those that have had a bad fatherly experience have to be led by the church and by the Spirit of God to the real true and living father, um, that we learn through Jesus Christ, that he ultimately is the, God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and of earth, who holds us in the entire cosmos in the palms of his hand, close to his heart. But here comes the greatness of God, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord, or instructed him as, as, as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? We're often consulting the Lord. I think of my previous uh, early Christian faith walk and prayer life, how I was consulting the Lord how to run the universe. We're often at odds with the Lord, saying He's done it all wrong. He doesn't understand. No, He does understand. And He does it all right. But He is sovereign. He has purposes beyond what we can imagine. And who taught Him the right way? What is right and what is wrong? God Almighty knows we don't. Or who showed him the path of understanding? Surely, I love this one, surely the nations are like a drop in a bucket. A drop in a bucket. Now, if you have a five-gallon uh, sparkle pail, which probably would be about that high, and you and I got a little drop of water from this cup here and put it in the, you would say, uh, the bucket's dry, there's no water in there. And I said, well, if you look carefully, you'll see a drop down the bottom. There's a drop of water. And he says, all the masses of humanity, seven billion people upon the face of the earth, are but a drop in his bucket for his eternal hands and eternal mind and his eternal sovereignty and his eternal plans. We sometimes have to be put in place. Yes, we are related to God. We have the image of God. But we are not God. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. And then verse 18, uh, To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare to him? As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashion his silver chains for it. A man is too poor to present such an offering. Select wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Now you have to understand, in the days that this was written, Idolatry was rampant because they didn't have books. They didn't have the written word. So you would carve out an idol with the features that you thought represented God. Maybe he had big beaming eyes. Maybe he had loving eyes. Maybe he had brazen hands. Maybe he had this gruesome look on his face. Maybe he had this expression that he needed his pound of flesh. But whatever you thought of God, that's how you would carve out an idol. We don't do that now. We write books. We write books about God. We don't have physical images, but we still have the same idolatry in our mind. Not all books written about God and theology truly trace the God of Scripture. It's the God of their own making, the God of what they think God should be. But when we come to the Scriptures, we learn who God is. Verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understand? Since the earth was founded, he sits a throne upon the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. Um, and then let's go down to uh, verse 27. Uh, why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. We get weary of life. I've heard many people saying, we're weary of this pandemic. 
We're weary. It's got to go out to sea. Just get rid of it. We can't handle it. But the Lord is never weary. And He's never, in a sense, weary even of our brokenness. But He keeps on intervening with His redemptive love and redemptive hand. He will not grow tired or weary. And His understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord, what happens when we hope in the Lord? We believe. We believe in the Creator of heaven and earth, the Lord God Almighty, who sustains everything by the power of His right hand. We're connected to Him and we don't have to grow weary. We don't have to figure it all out. We just trust and Bay because there's no other way. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. And I want to say they will walk and they will talk. They will talk about the greatness of their God. Question number two, uh, why are we reminded of the Father's relationship of the Son? Uh, because it is through the Son that we know God. John 1 verse 18, I think I have it there. Um, no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. He came from eternity. He came from the Father's right hand to reveal who the Father is to us. And when people come to you and say, how do you know there's something on the other side? Has anyone ever come back and told you? You can say, my best friend did. Jesus Christ, he was on the other side. He's been there from all eternity. And he comes over to this side to reveal the Father's love and grace to us. God so loved the world. And another beautiful one that I love is Proverbs 8, 30 to 31. This is beautiful. Then I was the craftsman at his side. That's the wisdom of Jesus speaking. I was a craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing always in his presence, rejoicing in his whole earth, and delighting in mankind. It was the delight of the Father to create the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. He was beside him, and he was rejoicing in the human family of mankind. There's been a real problem with Christians sometimes that they make mankind less significant than they really are. Uh, even, even Luther would use, well, I'm just a, a, a maggot, or I'm just a mosquito, I am a nothing. Well, on the one side we can say that because of our brokenness, but on the other side we can't say that, because God created this entire universe for us to rule and reign with Him, to reflect His glory and to speak His glory, which the animal kingdom cannot do. What does it mean to create out of nothing? Um, the classic text for that, um, Psalm 33, verse 6, question 3. What does it mean to create out of nothing? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, the starry host by the breath of his mouth. Right? We talked about the Trinity last time. The word, that's Jesus Christ, of the Lord, that's Lord relation, relationship, Jehovah, were the heavens made, the starry host by the breath, that's the Spirit, the breath of his mouth. That's what it means to create. We create things out of, out of substances that we have. We have materials. So we create, we put these materials together. But God created the original materials. In the beginning, God created to brought forth out of nothing by the word of his power, by the spirit, the breath of his mouth. And someone has said, you could just imagine all the stars shooting out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. The solar systems that we're learning more and more about now with a, a Hubble tel telescope that is now a new one is 10 times more powerful than the Hubble tel telescope that we've had up to this point. To find out 10 times more of the galaxies that came shooting out of his mouth when God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 7 from, verse, uh, from Psalm 33. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood fast. Question four, how does he still uphold and rule today? Well, if you, if you have your Bibles open to Psalm, Psalm 33, verse 11. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. And um, Isaiah 45, verse 7, I don't know if I have that one down. No, I probably don't. But Isaiah 45, verse 7 um, I bring prosperity and create disaster, right? Sometimes we just feel that God just brings all the good stuff and the bad stuff comes from the evil one. 
But we do have to realize that there is a time when God breaks down what he has brought forth. Yes, it broke his heart. We read Genesis 6. He was broken in his heart that he had to destroy mankind that he had placed upon the face of the earth. But there was no other way to bring forth redemption and to show in a powerful way what redemption was, was, was all about. And from there he went from Noah to an entire nation to show what redemption was all about. And now in the New Testament, he's gone from a nation to the entire world to show what redemption is all about. There's a very interesting text if you have your Bibles open to Isaiah uh, 45, um, verse 9. Um, and it says 9 to 10. Uh, let's see. Yes. So um, the question is, how does he still uphold and, and rule today by his providence, by his wisdom, by his almighty power. Uh, Hebrews uh, 1 verse 3 says that the, Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of the Father and upholds all things by the power of his word. But you've, you've got to read this with me. So Isaiah 45 uh, verses 9 to 10. Woe to him who quarrels with his master, to him who is but a potsherd. Now a potsherd is a kind of an archaic word. But in the King James, you may remember, what does Job do when he gets all these boils? He gets a piece of what they call pot shed. It was broken pottery. And the Bible tells us, why does the potter break the pottery? Because it's not what he had in mind. It's broken. It cannot reach its purpose. Maybe it's flawed. Maybe there's a hole in it. Maybe it's not the, the original design. Now, God didn't break uh, the, the pottery because it wasn't his original design. We broke it. We have not lived up to our original design. We are like a broken piece of pottery. We cannot fit the purpose for what God created us unless we look to Jesus Christ and we're redeemed by Him, His Word, and His Spirit. Then we reflect the praises. Then we're the piece of pottery that God had originally intended and He's put us back together. But He said, in your natural state, you are nothing but a broken piece of pottery that is good for nothing. And he says, Woe to him who quarrels with his maker, to him who is but a potshed among the potsheds on the ground. So you imagine all this broken pottery by the potter's wheel. And, these, and, and just imagine that they were animated and they spoke to one another. And they say, Isn't that a bit of a doom cough of a, of a potter? Look, he breaks us all. But it wasn't the potter that broke us. We broke ourselves. And yet we have the nerve to say to God, what have you made? Why have you made this? Why have you brought evil into this world? Why is there sin in this world? Why is there death in this world? We brought it into it. We are the broken pieces of pottery. We have not answered our purpose. Verse 10, Woe to him who says to his father, What have you begotten? Or to his mother, What have you brought forth? It is I Verse 12, it is I who made the earth and created mankind upon it. My own hand stretched out the heavens. And he, he verse 13, he even raises up a, a heathen pagan leader to fulfill his purposes in life. And finally, um, question number five, I believe I don't have too much time left, but question number five, uh, what's the comfort in him being our God and Father? Right? So eternal counsel, eternal providence, eternal God, almighty, maker of heaven and of earth. But if you go back to Isaiah 40, uh, we read it before, but let's just close with these beautiful, beautiful, beautiful words. Um, Isaiah 40, verse 27 um, to 31. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. I am poor, I am lonely, I am, I am bereaved, I am a grieving person, my heart is broken, I feel like that broken piece of pottery. Do you not know, have you not heard, that the Lord, your God, is the everlasting God, but He's also the Creator to the ends of the earth. He's got the entire world in His hands, and He will not grow tired or weary of a relationship with you, and His understanding no one can fathom. And he doesn't stand aloof from you, but he gives strength to those that rest upon him, that lean upon him, that trust in him. And he increases the power of the weak. Even those that glory in their own strength, young people, they will get tired and they will become weary. And young men will stumble. That's a picture of strength. A young man, he'll stumble and fall. 
But those that hope, those that trust, those that believe in the Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, will renew their strength. It connects them to an everlasting source of strength and hope and expectation. And that's what I was saying with the Renaissance on Sunday. Uh, that had been lost in our culture, and they went back to Greek mythology to try to bring in new thoughts, a new hope, a new expectation into a dead and dying culture. And they stumbled across, Martin Luther stumbled across the gospel that, that re-energized culture uh, to the point where it is today. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. And that's our God. Amen.